In this lesson, we're going to explore the differences between the different categories of cloud service. If we go and look at these skills objectives, what we're going to focus on in this particular lesson is describing that shared responsibility model, but then also looking at describing infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, serverless computing, and software as a service. So we're going to hit five of those assessed skills in this particular video. Now, if you think about shared responsibility, the idea here is that as the customer, there are certain things I am responsible for. And then as the provider, there are things Microsoft and Azure are responsible for. Now, who is responsible for what actually varies depending on what service are we using. But it's definitely the idea that, hey, there are different layers in any particular service and maybe sometimes I'm responsible, sometimes Microsoft are responsible, sometimes there's a mixture of both of us. Now, the easiest way to think about this is think about layers. And I can think about, hey, there's a storage layer. I need to store stateful information. A networking layer, connectivity. Compute, i.e. the servers. There's a hypervisor. So in Azure, this is built on Hyper-V. And then a building block is a virtual machine that that hypervisor exposes. So inside of that virtual machine, so I kind of think there's a VM here, there's an operating system. That could be Windows, that could be Linux. I might have a runtime like Java Enterprise Edition or .NET. And then there's the application and the data. And as an organization, where is that differentiation between my company and another company? Where's the innovation that's going to set me apart? Well, it's here. It's the application and my data that we really care about the most. Most of this other stuff is just things that have to be there for me to be able to operate. But that's not really how I excel as a company. These things may be pain points, so I want to be as efficient as possible to maybe reduce my operational costs. But what sets me apart from anyone else, what helps me be agile, is my applications, is the data that I have. Now, I can think about from a responsibility perspective, if I think on-premises. Well, who is responsible for this? It's me. It's the customer. The customer is responsible for everything. Now, they may have different teams. I might have a storage team. I might have a hypervisor team. I have maybe a, a team that manages the operating system. I might have a database team. But I am responsible for everything. Identity is in there as well. Everything is my responsibility. When I start to look at cloud models, the first cloud we seem to see, and this type of service we're going to consume, is infrastructure as a service, IaaS. This can largely be thought of as a VM in the cloud. Now, in this model, if I think about the physical fabric, the storage, the network, the compute, and then the hypervisor that sits on top of that, all of that is the responsibility of the cloud provider. So I can draw this line for IaaS here. So the responsibility of all of those things, in this case, I can say is Azure's responsibility. I am not worried about a physical server. I'm not worried about a certain disk. I'm not worried about a network switch. I'm not worried about managing or patching a hypervisor. None of that is my problem. So that's all Azure's responsibility. But because it's a VM in the cloud, everything picking the operating system, Windows, Linux, what version, what distribution, any runtimes I install, my app, my data, well, that's all me. So that's the customer's responsibility. Now, that doesn't mean you're on your own. There are many things like extensions and other services in Azure to help you. When I think about operating systems, there's responsibilities I have to perform. I have to think about, well, patching. 
I have to think about antivirus. I have to think about backup. I have to think about configuration. There are extensions and services to help me with all of that. So even though it's my responsibility, it doesn't mean I'm on my own in terms of tooling. So there are things in Azure that can help me do all of that. So yes, it's my responsibility, but hey, Azure's gonna try and help you out on a lot of those things. And that can apply to other things up the stack as well. But that's the key point, that's infrastructure as a service. Now, because of the responsibility of everything inside the OS and above is mine, I have fantastic flexibility. I can pretty much do whatever I want inside that operating system. I have a huge range of operating systems I can pick. I can configure it any way I want. I have direct access into that OS. So in terms of flexibility, I have full access. It's the most flexible option. But with that flexibility comes the most responsibility. I am focusing on all of those different layers and things like firewalling, there's all of those aspects I have to think about. So as we move up the stack, the next one, actually we do this a slightly different color, is PaaS, Platform as a Service. Now there are different kind of shades of PaaS, and this will make a little bit more sense later on. Now there are likely still virtual machines running, but I don't see them. I'm not worrying about them. With PaaS, the line of responsibility shifts all the way up to here. So with PaaS, Azure, my cloud provider is now responsible for all of that. Me as the customer, I only care about my app and my data. I don't worry about anything else now. There are still operating systems there, there are still run times there, there might be middleware systems there. I am laser focused on my app, on my data, what delivers the value to my company. Now there's a lot of different options in Azure, there's different types of PaaS services. And that's why I talked about these kind of, these kind of shades that we get in here. Because there's things like, hey, I can run Azure Kubernetes services to run containers all the way up to app services where I run some web-based focus component. Now my options are more limited. So with PaaS, because my interaction is undeploying my application, but I do not have full access to, for example, the operating system, there's gonna be specific operating systems that are supported. There are gonna be specific runtimes that are supported. There's gonna be a specific level of access I get to that operating system. Am I gonna get root access to that OS? No. Because now, Microsoft and Azure are responsible for that. So they can't have me just going in and tinkering about however I want. That makes it very hard for them to manage. So I have less flexibility, but I have a lot less responsibility. And hopefully I don't need that flexibility because there's a huge range of services Within those services, there's a lot of different options. So I pick the one that matches the requirements of my application. For example, an Azure app service, I can pick Windows or Linux. I can pick, hey, do I want .NET? Do I want different types of Java? There's a whole bunch of different runtimes that I can select. So although, sure, I am losing some flexibility, there are a lot of configuration and choices so I can pick the one that is closest to what I actually need. So if I think about from a, a type of service perspective, absolutely, I as we kind of start as a virtual machine, there are even things like virtual machine scale sets where it creates and deletes the VMs based on scaling options. But then I can think about there's containers. So I can have individual containers with Azure container instances I can have full Kubernetes, which is an orchestrator for richer container environments, but Azure is managing that Kubernetes management fabric. Then there are things like app services. Anything that's HTTP, HTTPS web-based. This could be, hey, it's a, an endpoint. It could be a website. It could be a mobile API that I wanna access. App services are very rich for that. So I pick, what do I need based on what I want to do? Now, another type of PaaS service 
and it still pairs, but you'll hear the idea of serverless. So what does that mean? For all of these types of service I've mentioned, there is a VM building block underneath. What I'm paying for is a certain type of virtual machine, a certain number of virtual machines that I need for that service to run. With a serverless offering, there is no underlying unit of infrastructure I see or pay for. I pay for the work that is done to achieve the goal of that particular function or that particular flow that it needs to do. These are typically event driven. So event driven means something happens that triggers this to run. I'm writing a file to a storage account, like a blob. Uh, I'm writing a message to a queue. I'm calling a RESTful endpoint. There's something happening, it could even be a scheduled event. Something is happening that is going to trigger, so an event happens that's gonna trigger these serverless things to run. And then I pay for the work that is done, the CPU cycles that are used, uh, maybe the amount of memory that is consumed. And this is really the gold standard. If I can get to here, we love the serverless. And there are different types of offerings here. There are things like functions, which is actually part of app service. Then there are things like logic apps. Logic apps are very good. It's a, a graphical flow that I can drag and drop components. Hey, someone posts a Twitter message, We'll go and call this maybe cognitive service to get a sentiment, is it positive or negative? Um, then go and write out a message or send something else. So these are the serverless offerings that are not paying even for some unit of virtual machine that these other PaaS offerings are still built on and what I pay for. Here, I just pay for the work that's actually done. And then at the far end of kind of this, this scale, I'm gonna use gold for this one is SaaS, Software as a Service. Now this is where the entire business function is delivered. With all of these other offerings, hey, it's delivering maybe a VM. Hey, it's delivering a runtime and a unit I can work on. With a SaaS solution, it delivers the actual business value. Because for IaaS and PaaS, it's giving me something, but I have to still write my application to deliver the business value. With SaaS, it's delivering that. So this is not really an Azure function, but this could be something like Microsoft 365. Dynamics 365, maybe using Salesforce. Those are SaaS solutions. It's delivering a business value. And you'll notice there on that line, what are you responsible for? Nothing. You're not, up, if this was Microsoft 365, are you upgrading Exchange? No. That messaging service is just delivered and it's maintained by the Microsoft 365 team. So software as a service is delivering the business function that we actually care about. It's delivering the app. I'm not worrying about the availability of messaging servers. I'm not worrying about, hey, is my data backed up and replicated? That's part of the service. Now, as I think about this, there might be basic admin I do, like enabling users, but it's just delivered for me. And so as I'm looking at, well, what do I want to use? What matters to your company? The business function. If I can use a SaaS service that exists out there and does the job, fantastic, I'm responsible for nothing. I'm just getting the business value. Okay, it doesn't exist, I need to create it. Well, if I'm writing something in my architecture, I wanna use serverless as much as possible. Maybe I'll use app services, different types depending on the use case, but I'm minimizing my responsibility to again, just be my app and my data, the things that deliver real value. Maybe it's saying legacy. I'm moving something from a, an on-premises, well then, hey, I can use a virtual machine because that makes sense for this unit of work. And maybe I just need to run it on-premises. I still have those choices, but as much as possible, I wanna get as far 
to the right as possible. If I can use SAS, I wanna use SAS. If I can't, hey, I wanna use PaaS. And then maybe I use IaaS, maybe I still run it on premises. So those are the key different types of cloud service we have.